Welcome everyone to the Fujifilm GFX 100 The Second Complete Camera Guide. My name is John Gringo and this is a big camera with a big sensor and I have got a big class on it. In here I'm going to be going through all the operations of this camera so that you can really understand how to use your camera and make the most of it. Let me give you a little preview of what we're going to be doing in this class. We're going to start off with a little introduction to Fuji and medium format and then we're going to talk about just a few basics, not too many here, just to get everybody up to speed on mirrorless cameras and sensor size. We're going to be doing a large section on the exposure, so all the different things that affect your exposure, very important section. And then another one equally as important on the focusing system on this camera, which is much enhanced from previous cameras. We have a lot of drive options and this is also where we're going to talk about mechanical and electronic shutters. We're going to take a tour of the camera and look at all the remaining buttons and dials that can be customized and worked in different ways. We'll look at all the different viewing options for the monitor and the viewfinder. The quick menu offers a rapid way to get to some of the most used features. We'll have a large section on shooting movies. A lot of controls are very different when the camera is in the movie mode. We'll take a look at all the connections that you can hook the camera up to, everything that plugs into it. We'll take a brief look at the available lenses and some recommendations in that regard. And then the following sections are all on the menu system of the camera. Each tab has a wealth of options in there and we'll be going through those in detail. And then finally in the end we're going to do a field setup guide where I'm going to show you how I would set the camera up for a variety of other types of uses. And by the end of this you should be an expert in this particular camera. Now, as part of this class, I do have a PDF that is available along with the videos. And in here is going to be some highlights from the class. It's not everything I say. Uh, to me, the most important thing in here is a complete listing of everything in the menu system, along with recommendations on how I would get them set up, at least as a starting point. I know everyone is going to have their own way of setting the camera up. So I have the entire menu system again with blank settings. So you can put in your own settings for each of the different options in here. We'll also have the setup guide, some other uh, graphs and charts in here about setting up for Wi-Fi and a variety of other things. And so this will be listed right along with the class video. So look for this when you purchase the class because this can be very helpful in many regards. All right, now as we go through this class, there's a lot of uh, things I'm going to be talking about in the menu system because that's where you usually make the change for things in here. And so I'm going to give you a shortcut box, a menu reference box for those of you who like to jump ahead and get these changes set. Uh, so if you want to jump ahead, pause the video, make your changes, and then continue along with the video. Now, later on in the class, as we're going through the menu system, I'm usually going to refer back to an earlier section of the class where I had a more full description of what that particular feature did. I try not to repeat myself too much in this class with explanations, so I'll typically only explain something one time. There's a couple of exceptions. I do know that, but just trying to streamline the process here. All right, so in this class, what we're going to be covering is the GFX 100, the second camera, obviously, but that is really our focus here. And my emphasis is trying to really instruct you on how to use it in a manual mode. Now, there are a number of automated features on this particular camera, and we will be covering those, but it's my emphasis to really make sure that you understand how to use the camera in a manual mode. That way you can repeat whatever it is that you are doing. Now, notably, what I will not be covering in this camera, in general, are other things that you hook this camera up to. So for remote shooting, it depends on the type of computer and the program that you're running and what exactly are you doing? Are you downloading? Are you tethering? Are you doing something else with it? And that just gets into a whole Pandora's box that, well, is well beyond the scope of this particular class. I'm really concentrating on how to shoot and get good images with this particular camera. So when it comes to flashes and other accessories that you hook up to here, maybe that's another class down the road that just opens up, as I say, a lot of different options that we don't have time to get into. Now, as we talk about, you know, what we're covering and what we're not, I also am thinking about who this class is for and who the audience is that is watching this. And I realize that 
there is going to be a large number of people in here who are very experienced with Fuji cameras, photography, and medium format, and that's great. But there's also a lot of newbies in here, uh, people that are new to Fuji or new to medium format or some other aspect of this. And if I could talk to those more experienced users for just a moment. So if you could approach the bench over at camera two. All right, gang, here's the deal. Um, I know you guys are really smart and you know a ton of stuff and you've got a long history in photography and that's fantastic. But over at camera one, there's a bunch of newbies and well, they want to be a part of our community and that would be a good thing for us because the healthier our community is, the more Fuji cameras and the more Fuji lenses and the better support system we have. So we want to grow this community. So I kind of feel like it's my job to explain things that are kind of simple to some people like all of you. Uh, I'm not going to dwell and spend a lot of time going over basics, but I am going to be covering some basics. And this is of no insult to you because I know you are super smart and it's not that they're dumb. They just haven't learned about some of this stuff yet. And I don't always know what they know and what they don't know. So I just kind of like to explain things, you know, it's kind of the job of being a teacher. So if I could just have a little bit of patience on your part while I cover a few basics, that would be fantastic. Because the more healthy this community becomes, the better it is for all the individuals in the community. Um, I'm thinking about a lot of other medium format companies that really don't have a vibrant system anymore. Pentax, Bronica, Mamiya, Roly. We want a very healthy system. We want lots of people to be a part of it. So I thank you very much in advance for your patience. And uh, let's go back to camera one and get everybody back together again. All right, thanks. All right, thank you everybody for, for that little aside there. All right, now this class is not completely in lieu of the instruction manual. I am trying to replace the instruction manual as much as possible with easy to see graphics and videos and explanations, but the instruction manual is going to be nice for detailed specifications, uh, specific compatibility, and a little bit further information on a few particular features. And so don't, don't throw it away yet. You might need it for something, uh, but hopefully I'm going to cover most everything you need to know in this class here. All right, so welcome to Fujifilm. If you have not had a Fujifilm camera before, they have a long history in photography. Of course, they have a uh, long history in the film aspect of it. They started making cameras, and so Fuji plus camera equals Fujika, and so that's where some of the Fujika cameras come from. But one of the areas that I have a lot of personal knowledge, and it's something that's very important to me, is the medium format history of Fujifilm. You see, uh, many years ago, I worked in a camera shop and my job was running the medium format department. So I worked with a lot of Fujifilm cameras back in the day and they had a lot of really cool and interesting and different cameras. Uh, six by eight studio cameras. They had rangefinder cameras for travel photography. They had panoramic cameras. It was a real interesting eclectic collection of cameras that they've had over the years. And so seeing Fujifilm back in the medium format business now makes perfect sense. This is where they have a very long history. Now they have made all types of medium format cameras over the years. They've made viewfinder cameras, twin lens reflex, range finders, SLRs, panoramic. They have really run the gamut of all the different types of things that they have. And so uh, if for some reason you're new to this thing and you're like, who's Fujifilm and what do they know about medium format cameras? Trust me, they know as much as any company out there. They are fantastic at making lenses and working with this larger format series. Now, Fujifilm cameras, a lot of their emphasis has been on their X system. This came out in 2012. It's got a crop frame sensor. They've got a full collection of lenses for it. They are some of my favorite cameras for travel photography as well as general photography. Uh, so that's where a lot of the Fujifilm community is. Now, Fuji also makes point and shoot cameras, not too many of them, but they do make some very nice ones. And they also have a huge business in the instant film market. This is actually, I've read some reports, well, this is the largest generator of income for Fuji. And so uh, not something that I personally use a lot, but I think they're fantastic little cameras. And it's great that they have this little side hustle that is earning them so much money. 
because the medium format division is relatively small. It's been growing and it's hit a certain maturity level now, as of recently with this particular camera, which is why I wanted to come out with a class with this, because this is really a fantastic full-fledged medium format system that is going to be of interest to a lot of different types of photographers. So currently, they are making a number of different cameras, and some of these might be discontinued by the time you see this, but they have a variety of cameras from 50 to 100 megapixel rangefinder style, SLR style, full-bodied style, and they also have a very good collection of lenses. And the lenses have grown enough now, once again, where this is a system that can be used by a lot of different types of photographers. So whether you're shooting in the studio, whether it's fashion or portrait photography, you're doing commercial work in the field, perhaps even professional travel photography, lifestyle, wedding work, these cameras now have the capability, exposure, focus-wise, uh, just kind of ergonomics and speed of use that you can use this for just about everything. Uh, I don't know that I would be going to the Olympics and shooting professional sports in action, uh, but I could see how some of those would have this for doing their portrait sessions and certain sessions where this would work and they do want the extra resolution. And so they've got this fantastic system. And the system of lenses has grown large enough that I wanted to do a class on this. And so you can also find available if you want a great guide in what lenses to buy, how to use them, how does the technology work, how to get the most out of your lenses, because this is uh, an ecosystem. Bodies and lenses, they go together, and getting it all together right is very important. And so I have a class on all of the Fujifilm, both the X-mount and the G-mount lenses. Now, if anyone is new to medium format, where does this fit? Why is it called medium format? Well. 35 millimeter film was one of the most popular choices of film for many, many decades. Uh, one of the trick questions you can trick your friends with is, why did they call 35 millimeter film 35 millimeter? And most people don't know the answer. It's really very simple. It's the width of the film, including the sprocket holes. It's the full width of the film. Now, back in the day, really serious professional photographers, portrait in the studio, some landscape photographers out in the field, would use large format cameras that used sheet film, usually four inches by five inches or eight by 10 inches if they were having a really big camera. Now between these two mediums, well, there was roll film. And this roll film measured about 61 millimeters across. And there was a variety of manufacturers that used this roll film, but they kind of used whatever image area they thought was most appropriate, whatever they like to work with. And so six by six was one of the more common early in the day, a square format, but then some made it smaller, six by 4.5 centimeters, and some made it larger, all the way up to six by 17. You could kind of do whatever you wanted to do. And so medium format was simply larger than 35 millimeters and smaller than four by five film. And that's how uh, it got the name medium format. Now, the sensor in this particular camera is quite a bit smaller than those traditional medium format sizes, but it does still fit within the 35 millimeter full frame size and four by five large format size. So yes, I think the name medium format is appropriate for this. And given the change in digital compared to film, uh, this is where you need to go to get that extra level of quality in comparison to a 35 millimeter full frame. It is about 68% larger or 1.68 times larger, depending on how you like to run your math. Now you can decide yourself as to whether 68% larger is significant or not significant. If you're saying, well, it's not that much bigger, you really also need to think about exactly how you use your images and how you crop your images because the aspect ratio between these two formats is different and that may have an impact in how much you need to enlarge your image. Now here in North America, one of the most common enlargements is an eight by 10 enlargement. Now when you do that with a 35 millimeter piece of film or a full frame sensor, you're cropping off a lot of the top and the bottom of your frame and you're not really using the full image area of your sensor. Now the four by three aspect ratio of this particular camera is more of what is considered to be an ideal format. See, back in the day when I was running the medium format business, kind of one of the philosophies is that 35 millimeter film 
was nice and all, but you cropped a lot of it out of it. And it really depends on whether you're shooting horizontal or vertical. Now, my personal feelings on this is that I really like the one by one and a half aspect ratio, or three by two aspect ratio of full frame when it comes to shooting horizontal. I like that wide look. In fact, I even like 16 by nine in many cases for a landscape type scenic shot um, for travel photography or landscape photography. Now, when I go to shoot photograph people and I turn the camera vertically, either for a tight head shot, head and shoulders or full body shot, I find that the three by two aspect ratio is too tall and skinny. A lot of people do. And I prefer cropping to around a five by seven aspect ratio. I think that looks more natural to me in a vertical format. And that comes much closer to the aspect ratio of this medium format camera. So there is less wasted space. So if you're going to an eight by 10, it's now 89% larger, which is almost twice the image area which is going to give you a lot of benefit of more pixels on your particular subject. Now, when it comes to the number of pixels and the quality of this camera, we're dealing with 102 megapixels, which is quite a bit more than any full frame camera, but I wanted to run a test here. And I'm just going to let you know right from the get go, the test I don't believe really showcases the quality and difference with this camera over full frame cameras. It is better. I can see it, it's, it's clear to me here. It's not a huge difference, but it is a step better. Now, my personal anecdotal story on this is the first time that I got this camera, first time I've shot with a 100 megapixel camera, I was doing a portrait shoot and I shot a bunch of people in a studio situation and I brought the images back to my computer, I downloaded them. And of course, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna zoom in and see how sharp they are. This is the first time in 25 years of photography that I literally gasped at how sharp and detailed the images were. In every other case, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of nice. And in this one, I did have my, my, uh, my program automatically set to zoom in at 200%. So it was in quite close. And I was, you know, had like a full body shot and I zoom in and I saw the detail in the face. I was, oh my gosh. Well, look at this, this is incredible. Uh, this does a, an amazing job. And so if you are looking for detail, uh, I have got to put this camera in one of the greatest cameras of all time. Now it's not a great sports camera. It uh, may or may not be your choice for a great travel camera, but the resolution, the speed of the focusing, the controls on the camera, the available lenses, this is one of the greatest cameras and one of the greatest camera systems I have ever seen. It is absolutely fantastic not without some flaws. Yep, we're not gonna go into that right now, but it is one of the greatest cameras of all time, in my opinion. All right, care and handling of our camera. Uh, there is a bunch of warnings in the instruction manual. It goes on and on for pages. It's kind of goofy as to all the types of crazy things they warn you about doing. I'll just wanna highlight you on one. Uh, the product may fall, causing serious injury to child or adult, so be careful about storing this camera above people's heads. The construction on the camera, there's not a lot of information on this. Uh, magnesium alloy body, it's well made. It feels good in the hand. It's got a nice rubber surface on it. Um, it seems to be professionally made and pretty appropriate for the price level that it is. When it comes to weather sealing, there's usually a lot of information that comes from the manufacturer about it's got 89 seals and it's good down to this temperature and in this much rain. And Fuji just is real casual and like, it's weather sealed and they don't really give us a lot of information. And so, yes, it is sealed, but I don't know that this is something I would be shooting out in the rain with for prolonged periods of time, but that's kind of the advice that I have with pretty much all cameras. Now, something else I usually like talking about, but I don't have anything to say here is how long is the shutter life on this good for? Usually cameras are ranked as 100,000 or 500,000 firings of the shutter, and I have found zero information on this. And so I don't know. If I had to suspect, I would say probably a quarter million, maybe 400,000. It is a larger shutter, so it's maybe not as long as some of the full frame ones. Uh, it is a professional level camera. Fuji knows what they're doing in this regard. They've been doing it for a very long time. So I don't think that's going to be the weak link on the camera, but no specific information on that.
All right, let's uh, make sure your camera, my camera is ready for today's class. Uh, first thing is charging the battery. Now, okay, this is one little complaint here. Uh, this camera, very expensive camera to not come with a battery charger. In order to charge, you need to use the USB port on the side of the camera. Now, how long the camera takes to charge that battery depends on the amount of power coming in through that USB port, which is gonna depend on what the other end of that cable is plugged into. Is it a tablet that has a weak battery or is it a outlet? Um, and so this is where you get a vast difference in the shortest to the longest charge time. So you really need to have a PD power delivery cable plugged in and the right type of source of where that power is coming from. All right, we're gonna need a lens on your camera. We're gonna need at least one memory card. You can use either style in either of the slots for what you wanna hook up. Turn your camera on, which is what I'm gonna do now. Now there is a big difference between how this camera operates in the movie mode and the still mode. And we have a whole section on movies, which is gonna be section nine in here, but we're gonna be starting and working mostly in the stills mode for most of this class. Doing this really simply at the beginning, we're gonna turn our cameras to the A. You'll need to press in a button to go to A. Uh, there's a few lenses that don't have that, which means they're automatically in this mode. Uh, this will set the aperture of the lens for you automatically. And it kind of kills me to say this, but we're just gonna turn the uh, mode dial to P for program, which is the easiest setting on this. It's where the camera takes control of everything. And make sure that the Focus is set to single, so I'm gonna turn my camera around here so I can make sure that my focus dial is on S there. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, press our shutter release just to make sure that our camera is working. If not, this is where people go charge their battery, get a memory card that fits in there so they're ready for the rest of the class. Now, before we dive too far into this class, I wanna check the firmware on my camera and have you check your firmware as well. Now the firmware is the software that runs all the operations on the camera. And from time to time, manufacturers like Fuji will update the firmware and allow you to update software on your camera to either fix a bug or give you a new feature or something like that. So the way that you do this is uh, turn your camera off. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna press the display back button on the back of the camera. You're gonna hold it in while you turn the camera on. So I'm gonna press that. I'm gonna turn the camera on. And it's gonna take just a moment and you can see that I'm working with firmware version 1.20. There is a lens firmware version as well, 1.10 for this particular lens. Don't worry about the lens firmware so much right now. If you are at something below 1.2, you're at 1.0 or 1.1, what you can do is you can go to Fuji's website, look up this camera's name under firmware, and you should find Fuji's website where you can download that firmware to your computer, put it on a memory card, put the memory card in the camera, do what we just did here, press the display back, turn the camera on. The camera will then see that you have new firmware and it will ask you to load that firmware. And so go through the prompts to go ahead and load that new firmware. Now it's possible that Fuji's gonna do a firmware update down the road uh, that I don't know about at this time. And it's usually good to update the firmware. You don't need to be the first person on the block to update. Sometimes uh, people are cautious and they want to wait a few weeks, a month, to see if there's any problems with the new firmware because sometimes the manufacturers will put out new firmware and that'll contain a little bit of a problem that they didn't realize, but it usually surfaces after a few days once people are anxious to upload the new firmware. And so generally keep things up to date, but you don't have to be on the bleeding edge of those changes. All right, now another thing is, is that uh, chances are you, I know I have been playing around with my camera and making lots of changes. If you would like to send your camera back to a factory default reset, you can do so. You can also do so in a targeted manner by going into the setup menu and going to the reset option where you can reset the basic settings in the still menu. Or you could do it in the movie menu if you've been playing around in there. Or you can reset the setup menu uh, which has a lot of the, the basic settings for the particular camera. Or you can go through and initialize, which really takes it all the way back to the factory default settings, and you're gonna be starting fresh, setting the time and everything else. Now, I'm gonna just reset the still menu reset for myself, because I know I've been playing in there and I've got, I had everything else reset relatively recently. 
and I just want to make sure that my camera is kind of acting in a normal way without special programming. And let me just say, if you've got your camera already customized and you don't want to reset it, yeah, that's fine. You don't need to reset it. Just when we come to those certain buttons and dials that you've reprogrammed, just realize I'm going by the factory reset options. All right, so I'm going to turn my camera off and back on again. I'm going to dive into the menu with the menu button. And uh, we're going to use the little joystick for navigating up and down. We're going to use the left column to go up and down. We want to come down to the wrench and come over to the user setting. And we're going to go to the right here and we're going to kind of bring our way down because it's on page two of two. And we have reset. You'll notice the little arrow to the right hand side. That means we can go to the right for options. And we have our different options in here. And I'm just going to do a still menu reset. I'm going to come over here and it's uh, it's got cancel highlighted. So if I press OK, it's going to cancel this. I want to go up and hit OK. Now, something about this camera that I have found just maybe a little imperfect is that the camera has an OK button, which is nice to use, but it's in a different spot than the little joystick. Now, the little joystick back here is also a button for pressing in. And you can go up and down and you can press in on the button. But sometimes when you press in, or maybe this is just a me thing, you didn't press directly in and you actually went a little off to the side, it doesn't register the okay and instead goes that direction. And you think you pressed the okay, but you actually didn't. So I'll kind of do this on purpose. If I just press it a little bit on the low side, it goes down here to cancel. I have to hit it really directly in the middle. And so if you want to really make sure that you've hit it right, let me jump back into where we were. Reset. Is I will highlight the OK, and then I will come down here and rather pressing the center of the little joystick, I'm going to actually hit the OK button. I'll do that sometimes when I just really want to make sure that I did get OK pressed and I'm not going to have to go back and reset it again. So it depends on how good you are on your finger dexterity, which I thought I was pretty good at in hitting those buttons. And so just be aware that this is where a little mistake can happen. All right, folks, that is your introduction to this class. We've got lots to get to in here. So hang on for lots more in the upcoming sections.